Okay, today's schedule is we're talking about can today's vehicles still integrate aftermarket in car entertainment or with device systems. So we're looking at an overview of technologies of today and what the required skills are for upgrading modern cars with performance plus gear. So the first things we'll go through is who is in Arabia? What do we do? How do we get here? Then we'll look at the trends in consumer demand for in-car entertainment performance and the functionality. We'll look at the aftermarket satellite navigation and smartphone integration. And we'll talk about audio video upgrades, installation, integration, how to do the tuning and the safety. And then the last one, which is the interesting one, is we talk about aftermarket customization. So, who is Emma Arabia? Who do I represent? Who does Thierry work for? And how do we do this? Okay, Emma stands for the European Mobile Media Association. And we're the Arabian Sir, section of it. Car audio actually dates back, and in, in car entertainment actually dates back to competitions that started in the 1990s. So for 24 years, there have been competitive installers, competitions, and audio systems, multimedia, going back to the early 90s. You can look at some of the competition systems back then. They actually used D, uh, instead of DVDs, they had VCRs in their car. So we're talking back after the 8-track, after the cassette. They started getting very competitive and decided to do the competition. Um, it was started in the US, however, EMMA is a European association, and it, of course, the European continent is made up of many countries. So, EMMA was founded to create a level playing field for the sound quality com competitors that were in Europe, because they all had different rule books from different countries and all played by different games. And so, it was to unify all the different rule books and uh, bring them all together under one little playing field. So, Emma International is the leading organisation for all the European car audio associations all over the world. So, Emma is responsible for the yearly organised international judge training, which myself and Thierry both attend every year. So we are updated on the latest rules, techniques, installation, and how things are done. It is also the standardised rulebook, so when it's updated, and it's also, it's, it has its own media. So Emma actually has their own competition disc, which is mastered in a European studio by one of the leading producers in Europe, who also looks after, I believe, U2 and a few other major bands as well as a, produ as a producer. So, just here is a quick snapshot of what a car audio competition in the Arabian looks like at the moment. So obviously we have a gathering, we have our sponsors in the background with their flags. Um, can anyone tell me what, this, what, what location this is in, in the UAE? There's one big giveaway in it. Not quite. But for our world in the background, it's at Yas Marina. So we actually have an a agreement with Yas Formula One circuit to use their, their facilities to hold our competitions. So we have an in-ground and a grounding with major, like an F1 circuit of international repute to hold our competitions. And obviously we, we get to use their facilities, um, which brings the public in and gives us access to world-class facilities to hold these competitions in. So, Emma Arabia, we're the Arabian National Organisation. We're based in the UAE, and we're responsible for organising the car audio events in the Middle East. And our mission is to provide guidelines from an independent group of national car audio organisations all over the world. So we guide the competitors, we provide them the rules, and we provide them the standards so everything is a level competition playing field. And we also then work with the manufacturers and sponsors of distributors of various brands on how we can promote their brand to the general public at the same time. So, Emma encourages both 
competitors and the installers to extend their knowledge of the equipment they're using. So what we're saying is the installers who put the product in the car need to understand modern electronics of a car. Um, there's many a case and there's some famous cases around the world and stories of the installer that one day cut the yellow wire. It resulted in the airbag exploding on the Mercedes Benz, the installer losing an air drum and a very expensive replacement for the um, shop going forward. So it's about making sure installers understand modern electronics and modern cars are no longer just positive, negative and, and another wire going somewhere else. There is a lot more to it than nowadays than just cutting the yellow wire. So then this results in a higher standard of the quality of the installers and ensures that the equipment that is sold performs to its optimum. And when that happens, you have a happy customer. When you have a happy customer, they want to spend more of your brand. So this is how we work in this, to make sure that our competitors and customers are also very happy. Uh, we have our own website. Um, it's just in the stages of being finalized next week. It's under, obviously, www.miradia.com and it links back to the Emma International site. So it's a globalized site where you can then link back to the main site as well, which will give you the rules, the mission, and all our major sponsors and competitors. Okay, just quickly, there are four starts to the competition. We have ESPL. Quite simply, this is all about building the loudest car you possibly can. Um, you're talking cars that are in excess of 160 decibels. Um, and the world record currently sits at 182 decibels, which is enough to share concrete. Uh, we have Emma Racing, which is about modified cars and tuning. So we look at how the car is tuned as well as the audio within that car. And we have ESQL, which is the ultimate thing in party music. So it's how does the car sound when you're standing outside the car rather than listening in the, in, in the car itself. And of course, the, the foundation is our SQ, which is can we get a car to reproduce music as sonically correct as just sitting in a nice home hi-fi system? So if we achieve the goals above, Emma Arabia is looking to enhance the aftermarket as not only promoters but manufacturers, the distributors and the installers. So um, that's my part of the topic started so far and I'll hand over to Mr Thierry who will talk about a few other things, starting with trends and consumer demand and um, then I'll finish off at the end. Okay, so I will, uh, yeah, thank you Jason, uh, continue uh, to look into the, the trends in the market of the after, aftermarket um, in-car entertainment and um, we try to put together a wish list of uh, the activities that are performed in a car, apart from driving, that is. So, one of them is to make phone calls and receive phone calls. Navigation is an important one. Listen to music, radio, the news. Watch videos and TV, TV as well. Kids entertainment, I call that babysitting. Because when you're driving, it's nice to have someone take care of the kids in the background. Internet, radio, browsing also is coming to age in the mo mobile environment. And all of the above should be wireless, right? It's a wish list. And of course, you need to drive. So, we've identified topics that are of need and others that are of want. Need being as a functionality element, such as telephone integration with Bluetooth, GPS navigation in a car, you need to know where you're going and how to get there fast, babysitting as I mentioned, and the want list which is more of a lifestyle nature, which is audio video, to have the better system to enjoy while you're driving, streaming music from your mobile device, and I want to also tap on a point which uh, is a common saying that cars nowadays are coming with better, uh, better system, better sound systems. Better, yes, they are better than they used to be, but the benchmark is the past, right? It's not 
what is really the best music system. So what we do at Emma, when judging a car or when listening to uh, music inside a, a vehicle, we look at the sound stage. The sound stage is, if you think of yourself attending a concert, this is where the stage is. Okay? And when you're listening to um, uh, attending a concert, the sound stage is not where your feet are, which is where normally in a, any type of car that's coming from a factory, this is where the music is coming from. Yeah? So what we want to achieve with the car audio aftermarket is to elevate the sound stage as if you're attending a concert. Car functions and entertainment are now merged together into a one uh, in-dash solution. Okay, which is very important for the installers because nowadays to remove a head unit is not like removing a radio and replacing it with a new radio. <clears throat> Some of the cars coming from Germany uh, in particular use um, a standard called MOST, M-O-S-T, which stands for Media Oriented, so for the, the format, uh, it stands for Media Oriented System Transport Network. Yeah. And what it means is the whole system of the car is based on fiber optics and not electricals. And to tap into an optical system is much more difficult than to tap into an electrical system. All right? So also we're looking at solutions for that uh, in order to, to work on these cars. So, for the aftermarket satellite navigation and smartphone integration, we saw that now it has become a must, either as an OEM um, a solution, directly supplied by the manufacturer, or as aftermarket. And nowadays it is quite common to have these kind of solutions. Okay? But also uh, GPS, Bluetooth telephone, apps, okay, to get all the functions from your car over there on your smartphone. Again, wirelessly transmitted. What about the audio-video upgrades? Installation, integration, tuning and safety. So, what media support is the end user using? We moved from, as Jason was mentioning, you know, the, the, the VCR in a, in a car. Imagine VCRs, I still have some tapes in my, my storage, I don't know what to do with them, um, if anybody is interested. CD, DVDs, nowadays these formats are becoming obsolete as we speak. USB, okay, now moving to portable devices. Who is going to control? Is it the car commands or is it the device commands? We need to choose that. What kind of amplification? Are we going to use the OEM car amplification or are we going to be able to add external amplifiers that will deliver better sound, more powerful, more controlled? What speaker systems, the number of channels? Are we going into a multi-channel sound system in the vehicle or a basic, basic stereo system? What kind of acoustic damping material? A car environment is very sensitive because the volume is very small and the material of a car are reflective, most of them reflective uh, materials, like the glass, for example, right? we cannot do without glass in a car. Glass reflects sound. Sound reflected creates interference. Choosing an installer. It's all about safety, safety installation. This is what Emma is really very strict about, is that when you install a system and you deal with electricity in a mobile environment, you should be making sure that you're doing it right. Cleanliness, fabrication, sound tuning. Okay, we're going to develop this. So in terms of challenges and consideration, what people, end users are normally pulled or torn between is what kind of telephone are they using? Is it iPhone? Is it Android? Are they, are they going to keep the same telephone or not? Is it What kind of connector is it? The old connector for the 4S or is it the new connector? Or both? 
what kind of device am I using? Is it a smartphone? Is it a tablet? Might be the old CD I still want to use and the odd uh, USB stick. What kind of download am I using for my music? A lot of end users don't know the difference between MP3 and FLAC. Okay, I guess you don't either. <laughs> okay, that is a matter of resolution. Okay, MP3 format is basically a lossy format. There's a high loss of information. Okay, because it's very light. FLAC is a lossless format, so it is very heavy. Okay, but lossless means you get all your music in the file. Lossy means you get part of the music and therefore lots of distortions. Canvas intervention, do I want the installer to go and mess up with my, and mess with my canvas or not? Or I want to use a plug and play system, such as the one that we see here. We talked about most, uh, the optical system in German cars. These are some of the ad adapters for the you can see the fiber optics, uh, the, the two adapters here, uh, for uh, most cars. Mm. Where you can have telephone, audio streaming, auxiliary input, audio, which is music pre-out pre in some of the German cars. And of course safety, amplifier, installation, and adi adequate size of cabling, as well as fusing, is something that Emma really um, make a stand to teach the installers um, at least the ones that that are under our representation and what kind of look do i want do i want a oem finished look or do i want a fabrication installation okay should i be using the oem placement for the for the speakers and the amplifiers or should i be tailor making and fabricating panels So, why tune, why do a sound tuning in a car? And what do we tune when we tune a car for sound? First of all, speaker crossovers. As you know, speakers are different sizes because they reproduce different frequencies. Typically, the big speakers, big in size, rep uh, reproduce the low frequencies, which are the bass, and the small speakers reproduce the high frequencies, right, typically. And each of these speakers should be given the frequency that it can reproduce because if you give a tweeter low, fr low frequency, which is bass, not only it will underperform, but also it will break. Okay, so we need to set crossover points, which is the frequency given to each individual speaker. And this brings to I would say a benefit for the for the user, which is for the sound stage. Remember, we discussed about sound stage before. Now, typically in a car with the OEM system, the sound stage is on your feet. Okay, so do the experience when you drive off tonight. Switch on the music in your car if it's OEM system, and try to figure out where the music is coming from. Okay, visit us in our stand, the MR radio over there and we'll give you a presentation of a car where the sound stage was uplifted with an aftermarket system okay and then you can make the difference okay and this will be the result where the sound stage becomes then on the dashboard and gives you an impression that you're really attending a concert or a live performance time alignment which gives imaging imaging in music is when you can identify where is the singer, where is the bass player, where is the drums, etc. This is called imaging. Now, okay. uh, in a car environment, typically, you have this configuration where the driver in our countries, at least, are, is sitting on the left hand side and the speakers on the left channel are much closer to him than the speakers on the right channel. Okay? Now, in terms of audio, when you're at home, you try to sit in between the speakers so that you get a perfect stereo effect, right? So, thanks to time alignment, we managed to create some artificial delay in the speakers that are closer to you in order for you to feel like you're sitting in between the speakers. 
And this is something that can only be done with a digital sound processor. Okay? Giving you imaging. And then, equalization due to cabin acoustics. We talked about sound bouncing off the, the, the glass in the car. Typically, what you have in, in, a, in a car, I'll show you different lines here. This is the base frequency, this is the high frequencies across the spectrum of, of low and, and high frequencies. The red line is your ultimate uh, curve for, for the sound. Okay, you should have more bass in the car that you have high frequencies because of the noisy environment, all right, which is mostly bass. In a, in a car, you've got this green curve, which is without equalization. Without equalization, you have some frequencies that are really peaking. We call that a peak. And this peak, if you increase the volume, is going to hurt your ears or give the listener what we call uh, fatigue, you know, hearing fatigue. And with equalizer, we decrease these peaks in order to bring them to closer to the ideal reference curve or line, okay? Which means that you get a better effect and you'll be able to use your system to the max. And I will... This is your part, right? So I will let Jason continue with you. Okay, this is the final part of our sort of presentation. We're talking about customization. So we all know why OEM doesn't sound as great as it could do. We've got a low sound stage, you're closer to a set of speakers, you've got frequency inefficiencies. So what happens next? What does Emma do? Well, as we said, we do we do car audio competitions. So that leads us and our competitors to start customizing their cars. And part of what that leads us for is how we help the industry in general is when you customize a car, you're spending money. You're spending money on the installation, you're spending money on the aftermarket equipment, and you're spending money in general just to be part of the thing. And most people, if they do a stereo, they do wheels, they do tires, they do body kits, and they like looking at paint as well because they love their car. So this is what we're talking about. Why do people go to such lengths to customize their car? In the audio systems, as we mentioned earlier, or as I mentioned, you have the people that want the very loud system, and then you have the people who want this quality system, and then the people that want the loud but quality outside the car. So there's different ways of doing and achieving the same goal. But the reason people go to such lengths is because if you're going after the pure sound quality, you have to, you have to then customize your car, because sometimes, even with what Terry is talking about with digital processes, you still cannot get that stage exactly right. So you do things like build speaker speaker pods in unusual places. You'll move things around the car in order to fit speakers into the car. And that's where we're talking about the customization. So what are they trying to achieve for customization? As I said, stereo imaging, the height of the sound stage, and also it's also that good look feel where you have a customized car that is different to everyone else's. And that gives you your unique personality because people like to personalize their cars. Um, this last one is, I was hoping for more people, but we've got enough here now. What does it cost? Um, just generally, we find in the UAE market, people aren't as willing to spend their money on your car audio yet. And we're getting there slowly. But just as a general, we're talking about to win a competition, how much do you think you should spend on a car audio system? And can I just get... And I'll just throw some numbers, and then if you if you agree with that number, throw your hands around. Um, the final number will be if you're trying to actually win the national title slash international titles. So who reckons you can do it for like two thousand dirhams? Is a good a good a good amount of money to spend on a on a car audio system. Four thousand? Is that enough? You go in there, you can get some. I know you can buy some amps and speakers. Actually, you can do a decent job on 4,000. You can buy some. It's not about the expense of the equipment. It's about the installation. That's the first key matter. I can take you to cars that have been done for 4,000 4, dirhams. 
they sound not bad. They sound better than OEM. And I can all, I can put them against. Okay, if you go by Mercedes and you tick, you tick. I want the Bose system. Or you go to Audi and go, I want the BMW system. I can bring you the cars that will have spent four or five thousand dirham that will sound better than these thirty thousand dirham options. It makes them sound sad. Um, okay, we'll keep going. Twenty thousand sound like a reasonable number. So twenty thousand dirham to throw at your car. You've got that pocket change flying around. No, forty thousand. Sixty. Oh, we've got one hand going up and they're getting close. Okay then, how about if I told you I know of three, four cars in the UAE that have over 100,000 spent on them. 100,000 dirham. People are willing to spend that much money on them. I know I've got two of them. Um, yeah, that is what it takes to win. That is what people are willing to throw at it. And that's what the, that is what is happening now in our market. Last year we had an average of 20 competitors per event, right? And if you take their average spend, which would be around about 10 to 15,000, you're talking people with 100, you know, 20 competitors, you're talking 300,000 euros worth of equipment now. This year we averaged close to 30, 35. And the game had moved and people were spending more. Next year we're looking to have an average of 50 to 100 competitors all spending more. So the importance that Emma brings to the game is we bring people who spend money in the industry. We bring people that spend money at shops and in order to win you have to constantly evolve. You can't do spend a hundred thousand on your car and I'm a victim of this. You can't spend a hundred thousand on your car and then expect next year for it to be a winner again. Because someone else will come along and they'll do the same and they'll do it slightly differently and they'll have got the latest equipment and then you're behind the game. So it's a constantly evolving product. So there's OEM integration and then the customization is another game altogether. So here's some pictures of some customized systems. So this one here is a it's a class winning car. It is a Toyota Camry. Um, who wants to guess how much that one's worth? This one's not so bad. It's about 24,000 dirhams, I think, the guy spent on equipment and that. And he's now upgrading again to the next level because he's not happy at, the, at what's happening in his competition. Okay, um, this is an example of the type of customization that people go to. Um, this is all Alcantara, all embroidered to match the manufacturer's logo 100%. You know, that's the details that count to set the car apart. And then, we talked about the loud cars. Here's another one. Um, as you can see, there is literally nothing left in this. It's a Mercedes ML, and that is a wall speakers, and that's got about 80,000 worth of equipment in it. So this is the level of customization people are willing to go to, and this is what they're willing to spend and sacrifice. Okay, still going on about customization. Here's some, here's some examples. We talk about, um, Earlier, there was a, just before us, we talked about batteries and people talked about the length of batteries. If you look here, this is just the electrical system on that previous ML. So we're talking four truck batteries in addition to the front battery. We're talking solid machined aluminium bars to carry the current. And then if you want to have an idea of how big those cables are to carry current on a 12 volt car, put your thumb up and the cable is thicker than your thumb. It is zero and double zero gauge cable. It is capable of carrying up to six, six um, seven hundred amps worth of current. And then it's coming all out of here just to put supply the amplifiers for that car to power the speakers. So in order to hit the numbers. <coughs> and then I've got an example of this is what bad modification is. This is what your customer doesn't need. Because you can see here they've tried to do a good job, but you see there's a gap in the stitching, there's closeness there. And then you've got all these wrinkles here where it hasn't taken to the forming correctly. This is what we try and avoid when we talk about good installation and working with our installers. Because you deliver your customer that, they're not going to be very happy. So, so going back to what does the industry have to gain from all this? 
Um, how much time do you think a full customised car might take to build in a shop? Any idea? One week? Two weeks? I've got a winner of four. A good car should take anywhere between five to eight weeks at 40 hours a week of build time. Minimum close to 500 to 1,000 labour hours. So if you have a customised shop who's building a car and you have daily rates, you should be able to charge these people that sort of money if they're building a competition level car. Even a decent car after market is going to chew up at least minimum 80 to 120 hours worth of labour, not including parts. So the industry gains from the, the installation side, they gain from the selling of the speakers, they gain from the selling of the cables, the accessories. When you're talking to car audio guys, we buy batteries. We buy batteries like they're going out of fashion. And regardless to what anyone says, we buy quality batteries because the current draw to us is super important. Okay, so how do we take advantage of this? So Emma promotes the industry, we promote the aftermarket. Um, you know, I'll run through a list of our major sponsors. We, we have Pioneer as our major sponsor. So we work with Pioneer in order to identify people that use Pioneer products. So Pioneer can target those people and target the passers-by of the competition to use Pioneer products as the best. So what's Pioneer's goal? Pioneer's goal is to win. So we also have uh, Thierry's brands, Focal, Rax, and Blam, and we have um, other brands such as Kicker, Soundstream, Vibe Audio, and then we have shops that we work with in, in Abu Dhabi, Neo Glow, and um, Monster Team, Monster Sounds. We work to promote them because they are the leading industry suppliers. They do the best jobs and they have the equipment that does it. So our job is to promote them. So if you ask me what I want, what I put in my car, I will name those brands. If you ask me who is the best in stores, I'll tell you those guys. Because we work with them, we train them. Earlier on, I mentioned about the airbag incident. I'll give you another incident. We have seen a number of installs, and I would. I would quantify them as dangerous. One, I'll give you two examples. What do you think happens when you run a cable through the firewall of the car from the battery at the front into the car because you want to buy your amplifiers in the boot because the installer does it? I would say 95 out of 100 installs in this country run it through the nearest available hole with no grommets. What that has is you have then a cable that is in a vibration environment where it vibrates, eventually the sharp metal of the hole and the cable wears through the cable out of skin, it then shorts on the car, the car then burns up. And this has been seen a number of times in the UAE. So your pride and joy has been burned because your installer has not done a good job and haven't used the right, right and stuff. Emma, we, we judge these things and we actually go away and tell competitors to change them. Another thing is, um, People putting speaker boxes in the back of their car that are not fastened down. Now, I'll give you an example. A 500 gram tissue box at a speed of 100 kilometers an hour becomes a 500 kilogram missile that can damage you if you stop from zero to 100 in an accident. Now, let's say you have a large speaker box in the back of your car that's non-fastened and it weighs 50 kgs. How much damage do you think that will do to your passengers, yourself and everybody when it comes hurtling through the car once you hit the brakes? So again, we promote these sort of things about the correct fastening and tying down speaker boxes. Um, fastening of materials to the car, protection of cables, correct fusing at the right lengths. All of these things are uh, missed. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the installers come from areas that we know and will do the job for 200 dirhams. Is your, wife, is your life worth 200 dirhams versus paying a thousand for someone to do it professionally? In my opinion, it's not, but we need to educate the people. Okay, we talked about the big systems. What do they do? They lead to more work and faster turnaround and stop. And you ask yourself, how does that happen? What happens is a big system brings people into the shop. They see these big systems, they say, you can do that but I can't afford to spend that much, but I will put in a smaller system. Smaller systems are more cost effective for a um, company to do because they turn them around faster, they charge more per hour for the, for the labour, and they can turn around more cars in a day. 
big system is like your lead-in for your buying. It brings the customers in because they see the big system, and then you take it from there for the smaller customers so you can turn them around with a simple head unit replacement, head unit radio, and that sort of thing. Um, also, the customer's cars become the showpiece. This leads to more business and there's free advertising for any business going forward. So, this is the end of our presentation. I'd like to thank you for that. Thank you. And we're ready for any questions. This is the very first time that uh, the Board of Mechanical Academy has had any presentation involving in-car in entertainment systems. And I hope in the future we'll see more of you, gentlemen. Uh, so please, uh, bear in mind a couple of things. And now we want to hear the quality reproduction of our sound in our ears, don't we? So therefore, the sound should be, the stage should be up there. We don't want to be hearing it with our feet, okay? So and we want to insist that the sound system is replaced in a way that we can hear it correctly, such as the real sound system. And I'm going to suggest to you, can, if you're unsure of the installer, that you please say to him, don't cut the yellow cable. That's my learning for today. Thanks very much. Please get Joseph here. We are back here at 2.30 and, and RTA will be here with six experts. So we'll see you here at 2.30. Thank you very much.